Puji Tuhan. You can all hear me? Again, good morning. Thanks, Pastor Fergs. That was so good to pray for Malaysia and to see what God has done in our nation. You know, when we started praying for the nation, uh, even before the election and especially after the election date was announced, one of the words God, God spoke to us uh, was this, that what we are going to see in Malaysia is going to be so, in a sense, awesome, stunning, that we will have no category for it. And the way things have transpired and are transpiring and will be transpiring, I think, indeed, we have no category for it. Okay. And now, you know, today, even as we have come to the conclusion of the Kingdom of God series, how many of you enjoy, have enjoyed the Kingdom of God series? That's only three of you. Okay. <laughs> really good, right? And, and, and that's something that reminds us of what God has assigned, anointed, appointed, and apportioned to us to carry out. Amen? One of the most stunning titles I saw was, Jesus is not fair. Remember that? He's more than fair. <laughs> so, praise God. Um, I'm still getting this, okay? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know which button I'll be pressing after this. So, uh, let me just get my, uh, what do you call it? Okay, my Bible. Right. No worries, no worries, I got it, I got it. No worries. No worries. All right. Uh, still getting the hang of a music stand as a pulpit. Forgive me. All right. We are going to be looking at manifesting kingdom authority. How do we manifest kingdom authority? Jesus came to earth and he manifested kingdom authority, setting the stage for us to continue to carry forth what he has delegated to us. Amen. And We'll be looking at uh, the book of Luke. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 11 and we'll be looking at some verses. And after going through those verses quickly, what we will do is we will look at how kingdom authority is manifested, how Jesus manifested kingdom authority and how we are called to manifest kingdom authority. The thing is this, God strategically has placed us in this nation as well as in various locations, all right, by his sovereign design and he expects us to carry out certain functions to carry out to be his ambassadors he has delegated his authority to us and he expects us to conduct ourselves in a certain way to step into our place of authority to see his victory enforced amen but if we do not step into that place of authority what happens is some other individual Dark powers will come in and affect their agenda instead of God's agenda that we have been assigned to. So we'll be looking at that today. And I pray that as we do that, the Spirit of God will speak to you, will convict you, will anoint you afresh, will empower you, all of us, will empower all of us, so that our foot will be on the pedal, so to speak. We will not fall back, we will not step back, we will not slack. We'll not go back to sleep, but we'll continue praying and moving into the next level that God has prepared for us. Amen. God is not a regressive God. He's a progressive God. He's a dynamic God. He takes us forward. He is the living God. Amen. And that is what we want to see in our nation. We all know Second Chronicles 7.14. It talks about if my people, God says, if my people would humble themselves, repent, turn from their wicked ways, and seek and crave for his presence. Then we'll see change. He didn't talk about the politicians or the other inhabitants of the land. It is always the people of God that make the difference. Isaiah 9.6 talks about the government being on the shoulder of the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God, who is Jesus. He is the head. We are the body, right? Where is the shoulder? On the head or the body? Yeah, so ultimately, the destiny of a nation, the redemptive and prophetic destiny of a nation is fulfilled by a church that walks in alignment with what God has ordained. So we're going to jump into the 
manifesting kingdom authority. Let's look at uh, where do I here there this Anna okay got it All right okay we're gonna be reading from Luke eleven onwards okay uh, I'll be, let's read it together church let's read it together this the Scripture references are all from the Amplified Translation of the Bible, right? Otherwise, it will be from the New King James, and I'll tell you accordingly. All right, let's read it together. Now, Jesus was driving out a demon that was dumb, and it occurred that when the demon had gone out, the dumb man spoke, and the crowds marveled. But some of them said, he drives out demons because he is in league with and by Belzebub, the prince of demons, while others to try and test and tempt him, demanded a sign of him from heaven. But he, well aware of their intent and purpose, said to them, every kingdom split up against itself is doomed and brought to desolation. And so a house falls upon house. The disunited household will collapse. Whoops. Sorry. Okay. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom last? For you say that I expel demons with the power of of and by Beelzebub. Now, if I expel demons with the help of and by Beelzebub, with those whose help and by whom do your sons drive them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has already come upon you. When the strong man, fully armed from his courtyard, guards his own dwelling, his belongings are undisturbed, his property is at peace and is secured. But when one stronger than he attacks him and conquers him, he robs him of his whole armor on which he had relied and divides up and distributes all his goods as plunder or spoil. He who is not with me, siding and believing with me, is against me. And he who does not gather with me, that is, engage in my interest, scatters. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Anoint your word for your purpose. That God, between my voice, my mouth, and the ears of my brothers and sisters. You tweak that word. You tweak it so that it will become rhema, it will become life. That your word will meet each one of us at the point of our needs. And in this place, in SIBKL at Sungai Bolo this morning, Jesus, you will be magnified. You will manifest your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, it's so interesting. Jesus casts out a demon. A man is delivered. Someone who is in bondage has been delivered. And we see varying responses to this deliverance or exorcism, as some call it. Okay? Three reactions we see. The first one in verse 14, the crowds were, they marveled, right? They marveled. They were, they were wondering and they were bewildered. They were, in a sense, confused. They did not know how to make sense of what was happening. The second bunch, they attributed the miracles of Jesus to Satan, to Beelzebub, the prince of demons. They slandered him and they said, ah, he's doing this because he is in league or he's in cahoots with the devil. And then there were others who are skeptical, who are walking in unbelief, who told Jesus, hey, can you prove it again? Can you show us another sign and another sign and another sign? The fact of the matter is, when someone walks in unbelief, when there is a canopy of darkness over your minds, over your life, God can prepare a table for you in the wilderness, but you'll be too blind to see it and you will topple it. Your eyes will be on other things. How is that? Have you ever wondered sometimes you talk to people and you see things okay on the outside, their life seems all right. And you can see that God has blessed them, but they have got so many things going on in their minds that they cannot see the hand of God. They can pick out even the smallest issues, but they cannot pick out the good things that God is doing. There's, there were times when I, I'm sure we all encountered people like this. Perhaps we ourselves were like this. You know, when things were not going well with the nation, 
you could pick up everything and say this is not as it should that is not as it should but we fail to see God's grace. We fail to see what God was doing. We fail to be grateful to the Lord. These are the skeptical ones. The, slender, the, the slenderest ones, they are the ones that Jesus cautioned. He said, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, as you go on to in, in, in chapter 11, would be the unpardonable sin. So three reactions, one miracle, right? That's so interesting and i think today in church it's the same thing when god moves there are those who will be wondering those who will be marveling others will be attributing it to to satan and even others would be saying ah is that so or not or did he set up that that miracle you know and that in a sense the human beings that jesus dealt with are the same today there's nothing new under the sun. Same thing happening to new people. I'm just paraphrasing Solomon. Yeah, Nothing new under the sun. The devil then is the same devil today. And the God then is the same God today. Right? So that's the crowd's reaction. The first part, the second one, quickly, Jesus made a very logical inference. He turned around and he faced his accusers with a very interesting response. He says, look, can Satan be divided against himself? It'd be stupid, right? Satan is not suicidal. Human beings may have suicidal tendencies caused by the devil, but the devil himself is not suicidal. He is smart. He's not dumb. He's quite, quite smart, actually. All right. And whatever you see out there, it's like wrestling. You guys watch wrestling? During our younger days, we, we used to watch these two guys beating up each other, right? I mean, when I was watching wrestling, it was always Ric Flair fighting with someone. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And then after that, I watched a, 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 a Sports Illustrated program where these guys were sitting together and having a drink and hugging each other and saying, you know, uh, one of them said, oh, we conned those guys, didn't we? I mean, it was more, it, they were just jesting. But that, that's the truth. We look at it and we get so excited and carried away. But Actually, these guys are all in cahoots. We know about others, you know, people from other faiths who go to this Bomo and that Bomo. I know of a friend whose daughter had some issues and she was seeing some spirits at night. And, and I told him, I said, you know, Jesus is able to deliver your daughter. Why don't you come to the church? We can pray for you. Even if you don't come to the church, we can come to you and pray for you. He said, no, 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 don't worry. These are the specialists. He Ended up paying the specialist about 20K. And the daughter was supposedly delivered. Lah. But now I don't, I don't know what has happened. But it's like this. The captain demon tells the private demon, go mess up that person. Then the sergeant demon informs the captain, hey, mission accomplished. Just go there and tell the flood to leave. And you will get obedience, you will get worship, you will get praise. And that family, that bunch, will be bound to you. And that's what they do. It's all wayang saja, but we don't see it. Because the only person who can deliver, the only person who can heal is Jesus. Amen. He is the only deliverer. Satan isn't suicidal. Jesus asked these guys, hey, if you accuse me of casting out demons, why are Beelzebub? You know, he told his disciples, right, to go out two by two and heal the sick, raise the dead, etc., etc. right? So they came back and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name. Subject to us. And Jesus said, by whom? Whose authority do these guys, did these guys, your sons, your relatives, your brothers, cast out demons? Logical, can? So Jesus asked them this question. We know the answer. Next thing Jesus does is this. When he cast out demons, what he was doing was he, he was invading the realm of darkness. He was going into this territory of the enemy and booting them out, expelling them by force. My good friend, 
uh, Pastor Clement, he's in Australia now, and he used to tell me this. He said, he said, brother, if a king cobra comes into your house, you don't go and tell him, I love you with the love of the Lord. <laughs> and you tell him, please leave, sir. You take a stick and you whack him. Of course, in Malaysia, we call the bombala. But, but you know, you know where, what he's getting at, right? You know what he's getting at. Jesus manifested God's kingdom and he kind of like modeled this, uh, what do you call it? Kingdom authority for us. He showed us what a person fully submitted to God and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit can do. One man transformed the entire world. And Jesus also said, the work that I do, you shall do also and greater works than this. The works that I do, you shall do also and greater works than this. We'll be going to that uh, shortly, but I just want to get this out of the way. I just want us to look at the, the verses and what was kind of like transpiring in these verses, right? So, um, yeah, my timing is on target, on target. And then Jesus tells them about the strong man. We read earlier that this strong man, he is guarding his territory. He is tough, he is strong. He is kind of like fortified himself. And he is protecting what is his. The souls of men, those whom he has in bondage, he holds on to them. One of my friends once told me, the devil does not believe in divorce. Do you know that? He does not like anybody divorcing themselves from him. And so something like Hotel California, you know the lyrics, right? You can check out anytime, but you can never leave. You know? So that's the thing. When the, the enemy's objective is very simple, he's got a three-pronged agenda. We'll look at it later. He's got a very clear mission statement and we'll be looking at it later too. Jesus says this. He, the stronger man, when he comes in, he grabs this fellow, dismantles everything that he has placed to fortify himself and sacks everything he, he has. S-A-C-S, that means wipes, it, wipes out everything he has. One of the commentaries I read said this. He, there was one particular word. And I can't remember what it was, but it, a Greek word that he used where he said, an army comes, a greater army comes and sieges a city, lays siege on a city, surrounds that city, suffocates it of its supply, starves them, and takes apart the fortress that held that city together brick by brick. Can you imagine what Jesus did to the devil? He surrounded the, surrounded the enemy's city, starved him of all his supplies, attacked the city, and took it apart brick by brick. That is complete para defeat. Total and final. Amen. That is what Jesus did to the devil. And that is what he wants us to remind the devil and enforce. And when we face the enemy, we have this authority that Jesus has delegated to us. I'm not jumping up and down to tell you this, but I want you to absorb this. Well, I want you to just, you know, ask God to remind you of this. Okay, because this is important. What we share, what we minister to you from the stage, above the persons you see here, it is the Spirit of God that is depositing, depositing this into your spirits so that wherever you go, you will manifest kingdom authority. Wherever you go, you will be the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. And you'll see the agenda of God established. This is kingdom authority. So Jesus basically says, he sacked the devil, embarrassed him. You know, Colossians 2, 14 to 15. Jesus defeated the powers and principalities at the cross and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. That means it's like a conquering army tying up all these fellas. You know, they get shackled in the necks and all that and dragging them through the street, parading, parading them and saying, it. basically, it's like putting a mark on the fellas for Hitler. The devil and his gang and his minions. Guess what's the mark? Loser. Okay. <laughs> and he tells us something interesting in verse 23. Choose 
which side you're on. When it comes to war against darkness, there is no middle ground. You cannot be sitting on the fence or putting one foot here, one foot there. You are 100% with God or you're 100% with the devil. There's no 30% here, 70% there, 20% there, 80% here. No such thing. You're either with him or you are not. Jesus is either Lord of all or Lord of none. We choose. Amen. And it is some, that God does not force himself on us. He puts it plainly for us to see. And he demands, there is a demand there. There is an implied demand that he demands that we choose which side we are going to be on. In the book of Deuteronomy, I think 28, God kind of like outlines all the blessings and the curses. And then at the end, he says, choose, choose life. He tells you what to do, right? He is a good God and he points out to you, choose life. As you look at verse 24 to 26, which we did not read actually, but he talks about Demons, when a devil is cast out, he goes out and he kind of like goes into the wilderness, goes into dry places and all that. And then he comes back to his own house and he sees it clean and swept. Dibersikan, room service has come in and kind of cleaned up that house. So what he does, he goes out there and brings seven spirits even more wicked than himself to occupy that city to occupy that house or to occupy that person. Now, one of the things Jesus talked about with regards to evil spirits and vacuum is this. If there is a spiritual vacuum by means of natural necessity, some entity, some power will get into it. Believe it. You know, when you, you have a yard, right? So you cut the grass, you pull out the grass and all that. And if you do not sow any other seed in it, in three days, you'll see weeds growing. In a week, they will overrun it. So you pull it out. And the next time, the next round, even if you don't sow anything, in, a, in one and a half days probably, it will be full of weeds. In three days, it will be overrun. Seven days, you'll be struggling to deal with it. Right? That's why when Jesus cast out the demon from that kid, Remember, it threw that boy into the water and fire, right? What did Jesus say? Come out of the man. Come out of the boy. Do not enter him anymore. When we pray for the sick, one tip I want to give you. When you pray and bring someone into the knowledge of God, you're praying for the salvation of someone. You know what we do, Denise and I? We pray for this person and say, God, we declare open heaven over him. That your presence will always envelop this person. That he will not fall away. Because at that point, you are the spiritual authority over this person. You are God's ambassador and you're making a decree over him. And that person will not fall away. When we cast out demons, we'll say, you will not get into this person anymore. That's it. Your tenure has ended. You have no more access in Jesus' name. That's it. What's the point of catching a snake and just throwing it out of the house and going back in? He's going to come back inside. He might bring a few of his buddies inside, right? You make sure that he does not enter because you and I carry the authority of the Spirit of God. You do that. One of the things Pastor Ferg's mentioned when you were praying earlier, so critical, to walk in love. To walk in love. You know, these guys that we're dealing with out there, they may be from different political parties, different belief systems, different ethnicity and all that, right? But ultimately... We are all made by the one and the same God. Amen. Jesus died for that person as, mu and, and, as much as he died for us. Amen. And sometimes we look at this verse and says, I, yo, and we speak all kinds of things over them, right? You are, instead of releasing kingdom authority, what authority are you releasing? You who are supposed to be salt and light. Me, us who are supposed to be salt and light. When you bless that person, remember Jesus said, when you forgive someone their sins, they are forgiven. Right? When you refuse to forgive that person, sins are not forgiven. I was reading this, 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 this book uh, by Charles Spurgeon. You all have heard of Charles Spurgeon, one of these 18th century preachers, brilliant fellow. And he said something very interesting. 
on this verse, he commented this. He said, when you speak evil of someone, you, I'm paraphrasing it, lah. you bind that person to failure. You bind that person to iniquity. Let's say the person cut you off the road or something like that. Okay? Why don't you bless that person instead? Thank God for his life. Pray that he will encounter God. My sister, sister used to do this when we were kids, right? When someone does something, you will just say, God, I bless him. Send him off into a, you know, I don't know whether she blessed the person or not. Lah. She'll just pray that he'll go into a place of ministry, into a mission field where there are lions and tigers <laughs> to chase him around. I mean, we were kids then. Lah. But, but the thing is, we pray to bless that person. Lah. You know, not bless him with trials and tribulations. <laughs> but to bless that person so that they will encounter God. Because when we do that, we release the presence of God. Amen. One of the things, I mean, thank God for Denise. I, mean, I don't know where she is with Zoe somewhere, but ah, she's at the back. When we drive, when she's driving, she's praying in tongues. When I'm driving, I'll see her blessing this person, blessing that person, and praying for this person, praying for that person. Many a time I feel like running, running over them, but <laughs> she prays for them and blesses them. You know, and, and I shared with you guys, we used to go through this, this Kampung Melayu. That was so bad. You could see open sewage sometimes when it rains, you know. It was that bad. This is like 20, 22 years ago. When we first moved to Sungai Bolo. But she will pray. And she'll insist that I drive through that place every morning on the way to work. So it takes us about 20 minutes to pass that. And she's praying and blessing this place, blessing this home, blessing this shop. Now, hey, the place is so good, man. In fact, she was telling me the other day, hey, let's go to this place and have some makan over there. You know, it's so good. And one thing I, I learned is this. Hey, life and death is in the power of the tongue, right? Speak life, lah. You know, our, our, our fellowship this morning is not complicated. God is not a complicated God. He will never ask you to do something that you cannot do. He will never ask you to do something for which he has not empowered you to. Amen? You know, um, Uncle David, Sir Jenny, when they moved into that place, right? There was this bush at the back. It was like a so arid place, you know. So they decided to talk to the, uh, what do you call it, their rep. And then she started putting up a garden in that place. It's pretty cool, you know. I know they had some issues recently with some developers wanting to put a, a billboard there and all that. But they really transformed that place. They really transformed that place. Sometimes it's not about preaching, but it's about living out what we believe, you know. I think I've stayed on this slide quite long. Let me just jump to the next one. So going on that point D, Jesus said about that vacuum. In our lives, you know, when, when you break a habit, right? When you break a habit, there's this, this book by Quinn Shara and, and Ruthann Gallock, uh, Spiritual Warfare Ladies. Like, they're really good. You guys should read this. Old grandmothers, but I really love their writing. And, and they say this. Replace, we, we all know, replace a, a habit that you want to Eliminate with another habit, right? That is constructive, right? That's why when we say wasa, fast, right? Take that time when you're not eating to pray, lah, to read the word, lah, you know, not to go and sleep, <laughs> right? So you replace it with something else that will cause you to exercise your kingdom authority to see the manifestation of God's kingdom in that place, in that locality, in that time. That's why prayer altars, the time that you uh, dedicate to the Lord is so important because these are gateways that you are influencing with the presence of God. That's why when you say, this is the time you're doing it, right? I mean, of course, sometimes you can't really, uh, what do you call it, help it, but be sure to manage that and to maintain that. Amen. Evil spirits love vacuum, really. <laughs> and let's not give them any. Amen? Mm -hmm -hmm -hmm. Got it? Am I? Yes. The thief's agenda. I'm not talking about the reason Mimi that came out with the father of all thieves and all that. <laughs> okay, you all are... <laughs> You saw the reason Mimi, the father of 
independence, the father of nation building, and there was one, the father of thieves or something like that. No, no, we are not talking about that one, okay? We are talking about the devil here. And he's got one agenda, very simple, three-point mission statement. Number one, John 10, 10, the first part, the thief comes not, I'm quoting the King James Version, except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Of course, Jesus says, but I've come so that you may have life and that you may have life abundantly. So the first part, three things. What does the devil want to do? He wants to steal. He wants to take something. You used to have something in your life. Okay? You used to have something in your life. Think back. A talent, a gifting, something that God deposited in your life. But now... It's been stolen from you. It's been diminished by the words speak, people spoke that was not edifying. All right? Instead of encouraging you, the enemy used people. They are not the enemy. All right? But the devil, spirit beings, right? Messed up your trajectory. And then you now think that, oh, yeah. perhaps you used to lead worship. Perhaps you used to play the, the ha cajon. I mean, I'm just using examples. But these are real scenarios, right? And someone came and said, ah, oh, yeah, your timing sucks, man. Come on, lah, you know? And we know, I mean, we, we've seen people, I, I had people come and cry to me and tell me, you know, this person said this, you know? And one person said, ah, oh, your, your talent level is zero talent, lah. Serious, Christians, lah, believers. We all have done that, lah, okay? Seriously, okay? Knowingly or unknowingly, ignorantly, we have done that. I have done that. One person came and asked me, I mean, I was much younger at that time, and said, hey, bro, how was my worship leading today? I said, and, she, and the person looked at me and said, give me an honest uh, assessment. Honest. I said, okay. Somewhere between terrible and hopeless. And then I went away, you know. Of course, I wasn't married at that time, so I was a bit more abrasive, like, very abrasive. Thank God for my wife. <laughs> Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And then the person was crying there. But I just went away. I went and apologized to that person five years later. All right? I thank God I did. But I was thinking, wow, I could have caused untold trauma to that person, right? Seriously. Seriously. But I went to the upper... And that's why God has a good sense of humor. He sends you to the upper room ministry. I'll stop there. I'll, I'll, I'll not... <laughs> I will not elaborate further. Lah. Okay, but you know, God is God is good. So to us, what did the devil steal from you? Is that something? Perhaps you used to write, perhaps you used to anchor a cell, perhaps you used to anchor a prayer altar. I don't know. What did you do? Any gifting, perhaps you cooked and, and ministered to your neighbors, perhaps you hosted your friends. Something, many things, right? But the devil has extinguished that, has stolen it from you. Perhaps it was something that you were doing that was flourishing. The enemy came against you and just killed it. Destroying it. Something in your life that was destroyed. I'm not giving the devil more credit than it's, he deserves. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Someone once told me this. A, the devil is the best lawyer in the world. He's, I told him, no, he's not. He tabule pakai punya. The best lawyer in the world would be the wonderful counselor, right? Amen. Amen. Let me just tell you this, lah. In case you don't know, or perhaps I, let me just remind you, every one of us, even Adam, fell into sin. Adam fell into sin after he was tempted, right? The devil fell into sin when no one tempted him. You thought of that? Are you guys awake? Okay, this is the thief's agenda. To steal, to kill, to destroy. He will show you no mercy. He will kick you when you are down. Okay, do not expect any mercy from the devil. He has only one agenda. This three-pronged agenda. Steal, kill, destroy. But then, there is the Savior, Jesus. His agenda is very simple. I have come, Jesus said, that you may have life. And that you may have life more abundantly. Not just life, but abundant life. John 10.10, 10, the life of John 10.10 10 is a life that exceeds any curse. 
You are blessed beyond any curse. We are blessed beyond any curse. Amen. Jesus came, 1 John 3, 8, he came to destroy the works of the devil that are sin, sickness, death. To destroy means to nullify, to uproot, to wipe out. The word, basically, uh, one of the words, the Greek words to destroy the works of the devil is to take it, to take whatever is there, roll it up, just fold it, bunkus it, and throw it off, cast it out. So Jesus came to bunkus the works of the devil and to get rid of it. And that's what he is doing in us, through us, for us today. And finally, 2 Corinthians 1.20. One time we were praying and someone prayed Jeremiah 29.11 over our church. That God's thoughts towards SIBKL at Sungai Bolo, the thoughts of peace that give us a future and a hope. How many of you believe that? I had someone come to me and said, brother, you guys are so sesat. I said, why are we so sesat? He was a visitor, all right? He said, this is for the Jews who were taken captive. I said, have you, does your Bible have the New Testament, brother? He asked me why. I said, look at 2 Corinthians 1.20. All the promises of God are yes and amen to those who are in Christ Jesus. So all the promises of God are yes and amen to us who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. You have 2 Corinthians 1.20 in your Bible. I did not make up that verse. Yes. Amen. Amen. So what do we do? One of the things God spoke to us in this season is to step into recovery mode. To recover what the enemy has stolen. The Bible says when a thief steals, he has to make sevenfold restitution. I know some pray thousandfold, hundredfold, or no, like the Bible says sevenfold. I would, I would always want to go back to scripture. Okay. Uh, if Jesus said this, I don't want to better Jesus. Lah. I'll just go with what he has said. Sevenfold restoration. When a thief steals something, he has to make restore, restitution sevenfold. Whatever you have lost, recover it. Recover it. God has enabled you, empowered you to recover. Next question. How, what? How do you do it? First, bind the strong man. The strong man, is, in Greek, is iskuros, a powerful, possible, mighty entity, all right, that enslaves, intimidates, and puts a lid on you. It puts a lid on you. That means keeps you in a in a in a in a in a tint and puts a lid, preventing you from reaching your destiny. It's almost like keeping you in. I mean, I'm not a bonsai fan, lah. So for you bonsai fans, forgive me. It's like, you know, uh, stifling your growth. I went to this uh, friend's house and he was showing me. He was so proud of this mahogany tree. And he said, bro, look at this. And so small, two-foot bonsai plant. And I felt sad. Inside me, I was like, God, this tree could have, you know, reached its potential so that I could cut it and build some guitars. Anyway. You know, that's what the enemy does. He keeps you bound. The strong man, he binds you. He restrains you and forbids you from moving into where God wants you to be. He can bind an individual, he can bind a family, he can bind a church, he can bind a community. All right? Binding is deal. What does losing mean? It means removing the power that restrains, releasing, setting free. Another, uh, one, of the, one of the commentaries said, decimating the chains that hold you. That's what Jesus did. When he went to the cross, he made a public spectacle of the devil triumphing over the enemy on the cross, decimating it. I think this one is uh, in one of the Logos, uh, Logos uh, Bibles. I think it's, it's the Bible Scholar Library. I think it's one commentary that said it, decimating the chains that bind you, right? 
one of the verses God pointed me to as I was going through this is 1 Samuel, one of the passages, scripture passages. Remember David, King David, right? He went and aligned himself with Akish uh, when Saul got rid of him. And when he had issues with Saul and when Saul was chasing him. So he goes and aligns himself to Akish, the Philistine king. And then, uh, and when he was there hanging out with Akish, some Amalekites attacked his family and the, and, and the families of his men who were based in Ziklag. Everything was taken away from David. Everything was taken away. Their wives, their kids, their properties, their cows, their goats, whatever they had, dogs, cats, all got taken away by the Amalekites. But he went and sought God. You know, when he came back, his men, his buddies, were so overcome with grief that they wanted to stone him. Go back and check this. Today, you know, whatever I'm sharing, it's something I want you to go back and go through. All right? Please reach out to us for the slides. Please reach out to us for the slides. I want you to go back and go through this. Okay? What David did, he strengthened himself in the Lord. He sought God. And guess what happened? David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. Look at the two portions where it's like a parenthesis, right? David recovered all, the first one, and then it ends off with David recovered all. See that? Very interesting, huh? He recovered all. He didn't say, I, uh, you know, the Amalekites took it and went, let it be, you know, no chance. He recovered everything. He lost nothing. Everything. The cat, the dog, whatever. Every single thing. Both human and property. He got back every single thing. Amen? Why? Because God empowered him. God enabled him to. What are we to recover? What are we going to be looking at? We're going to be praying after this. But one of the things uh, uh, Pastor Ferks and, and I have been discussing is this. Next year at the Dominate Altar, we're going to be praying. And we're going to be teaching on these things. All right? The recovery of these items that you see. Personal promises from God via Scripture. You read the Word of God one day and God had this verse or this portion, this promise jumped out on Scripture. You wrote it down. You've been praying over it. But in the course of time, nothing happened and you forgot about it. The enemy stole it from you. Prophetic words. God spoke to you prophetically through a servant of God and you received multiple confirmations, but you still do not see the manifestation of that promise because somehow the enemy stole it from you. Spirit of persevering faith. How many times we've, we ourselves, right, end up becoming discouraged? We pray for certain things. It does not happen. It's not a no from God. Or a permanent no, perhaps you are not ready for it. Or sometimes we see things that do not go our way, not as per our um, how we planned it out or how we thought God will do it. You know, we are good, you know, believers are so good. We all want to help God. We want to tell God how to do things. We even want to command God to do things the way we want to. We want God to favor those that we favor. We want God to judge those that we have displeasure with. Thank God that none of us is God. <laughs> right? We need that spirit of persevering faith to just hold on and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying. We need that. And sometimes God allows us to come into certain challenging positions so that we can pray with persevering faith. And sometimes the enemy defeats that, steals that from us. And what we do, ah, yeah, we don't pray, you know, and then we start saying things that does not line up with God's word. The other thing is the joy of the Lord. Sometimes we are in church. We come because it becomes a drudgery. You do it because there's something inside telling you to do it, but there's no joy in serving God. There's no joy in worshipping God, in reading the word, in communing with the Lord. Then my question would be, why on earth do you want to go to heaven? Right? When you walk with the joy of the Lord, you will see the presence of God over you. And through you, God will just, you know, you will be releasing Jesus. We all have to get to that place. We all have to. And that's where God wants us to walk. 
We want to pray and recover that. Next thing, miracles of healing and deliverance. I have so many fellas coming and telling me, bro, why on earth are you praying for people? You know, if they die, they go to heaven, what? Since they are believers. I said, my God, John 3.16 starts here. If not, the moment you said, Jesus, I received you, I received you as Lord and Savior of my life, an angel would have just smashed your head and sent you to heaven. No. We want to see the miracles of healing and deliverance. And this is really close to my heart. You know why? I want to see us do the works that Jesus did. He promised us that, right? He promised us that, can't? Yes? And greater works than this, right? When was the last time, again, you have heard me say this umpteen times, lah, right? When was the last time you walked in the market and your shadow touched someone and he got healed? I know some people who walk in that level, seriously. No joke. I know this guy who, who prayed for, for someone who had died for four days and the person came back to life. But he heard it wrongly. I mean, someone called him and said that his dad is deceased. So he heard it as D-I-S-E-A-S-E-D. -E -E he said, oh, don't worry, I'll come and pray for him. So he went there and prayed for him and said, be healed in Jesus' name. And this guy gets up and everyone is running all over the place. And this chap, as he goes out of the house, they tell him, hey, that person came back to life. And some fellas came and they were like, like, they confirmed it. And we were like, we really wanted to be sure. And they confirmed it. It was something that happened in South Africa some years ago. We have seen healing. We have seen like Uncle David, God healed him completely. 100% cancer free. 100% healed. Do you know, in August 2020, the doctor said he would not make it past December 2020. That's a walking testimony. That's an evidence of God's love and mercy. He is still in the healing business. Sometimes we go through a longer challenge but it is to build us up, not to break us down. God is always a redemptive God. Miracles of healing and deliverance. That's something we, are, we want to see. Every one of us walk in it. Not just the pastors or the leaders. Every one of you. Everyone who comes to this church walking in that level. Why not? Jesus paid the price for it, you know. Fully paid. Mau ke tanah? Kan? What's the works? Itu saja. Would you want it or not? The wasted yes. So many times we do silly things out of our own ignorance, out of our own mistakes or the mistakes of others or you got set up and you failed, etc., etc. Those wasted yes. Hey, God will restore. Huh? Joel 2.25, right? What the, the, the years that the more the rust, the locusts eaten, right? He will restore. The cities the enemy has taken. God will restore. The sheep stolen from the flock, those who have fallen away from the Lord. I know friends who used to serve with me, who grew up with me, who are not in the Lord now, for one reason or another. And pray for the blessing of God, restoration of the blessing of God on our nation, on homes, on families, on individuals. This is what we're going to be praying for next year. On a weekly basis, we're going to be doing that. I'm going to teach on this. But today, we're going to pray for this. Now, I wanted to just focus on what, you, there are about nine things here. Whatever God is bringing to your remembrance right now, I wanted to just focus on it as I call up the worship team. I've got to move this off. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you so much, Ross. I don't. Thank you. I just want us to get to our feet this morning. It is still morning. Yep, praise God. <laughs> I want you to lift your hands to the Lord. I just want you to put one hand, your right hand or your left hand on your chest and lift up the other hand to the Lord this morning. I want you to know this. The devil can only take from you what you allow him to. Because you have the greater one inside you, he cannot forcibly snatch anything away from you. The devil can only take what you allow him to. If there were words that you spoke, that did not line up with God's word over your life, over the nation, over your family, over your spouse or your children, or your brothers and sisters, over your church. I want us to just tell God, God, 
I am sorry. I repent. Even if you spoke it over your destiny. Perhaps you failed so many times before. But God lives in you. He is not the he is not a losing God. When he is in you, you always win. You cannot lose because the God that you serve is a victorious God. Isaiah 41:10 says that he is your victory. He upholds you with his victorious right hand. Whatever you are praying for this morning, remember this. The God who lives in you is more than able to bring healing, to bring deliverance. If you're praying for the salvation of loved ones, if you're praying for a restoration of what the enemy has stolen, whatever it may be, God is in this room. God is in this place. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Those of you who have the prayer language of tongues, let's just pray in the Spirit. Even those of you who are at home, who are connecting with us online, Father, we just thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus lives in us by his spirit and he has delegated that authority that you handed to him, Father. The authority to speak life. The authority to stand on his victory over the enemy. The authority that saw him establish your word over us. To reclaim back everything that was lost. To recover everything that was lost. That none of our brothers and sisters, none of us will forfeit our destinies. None of us will see the destiny that you have ordained for us terminated in the name of Jesus. None of us will see any more stagnation or limitation or delay in the progress to which you have called us to in Jesus' name. And Father, even as we come before you this morning, if there be any word that we have spoken over ourselves, over our families, over our loved ones, over our friends, over our neighbors, over our, this nation, over anyone at all, any word that does not line up with your word, if we were used by the enemy, if we were deceived by the enemy, or out of frustration or anger or whatever, God, just spoke anything contrary to your word over anyone, including ourselves, we ask for your forgiveness. Forgive us and cleanse us by the blood of Jesus so that, God, we will be able to wield the authority that you have assigned to us in the name of Jesus. That, God, we will mark this day, 27th of November, 2022, that we will not be the same again. That any excess the enemy has into our lives, we close it by the blood of Jesus. We close it by the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name. And Father, we speak life over every single one of us, over every family represented here in the name of Jesus. Even those who are at home, Father, and we dedicate our lives to you. We dedicate our families to you. We dedicate the atmosphere of our existence to you, Father. And so, so God, you will assign your warring angels. You will assign your guardian angels. You will assign your ministering angels to watch over us, Father. Your word says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear you, Father. We are a church that fears you. We are a church that honors you. And so help us, God. Help us. Help us, God. Help us, Father. So that we'll be aligned to the plans you have for us with regards to the destiny of this nation. With regards to the destiny of this church. With regards to the destiny of our families and our community. Help us and teach us to honor you, to reverence you. In Jesus' name. Father, we also pray. Even as 2022 two is coming to a close. We thank you, Father, for bringing us through all this while, for sustaining us, for strengthening us, for empowering and enabling us. Father, it is our prayer, Lord, today that each one of us will possess our possessions individually and collectively as a church and as a family. 
to transit into 2023 gloriously. Establish your word over your church in Jesus' name. Establish your word over your church in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that you just pour out the spirit of intercessory prayer over our church, the spirit of reverence, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of counsel and might and understanding and wisdom, Father, that we would be, Lord, the people that your word talks about in Daniel 11 and verse 32 on the second part where it says that the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That is the portion of every single person here this morning. Those that are here physically, those that are connected with this service, Father. And God, we pray that at any time someone watches, Lord, this service, you just release your anointing to touch them. Release your anointing over my brothers and sisters. Release your anointing over this church, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, you are the King of all kings. You are sovereign and you are supreme over us. And God, this morning, we just want to bless you. We want to worship you. Father, we just pray that your manifest presence will increase in magnitude in each one of our lives. And even as we depart from here, Father, we just ask for a greater consciousness of your spirit and your presence. To open the eyes of our hearts to see what you are doing. Open the ears, our spiritual ears, to hear the voice of your spirit. So that we would be a people that walks in kingdom authority. That manifests kingdom authority because of the work of Jesus. Not because of our righteousness or what we have done. But because of who you are and what you have done on the cross, Jesus. We will establish your word even as you empower us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up His countenance towards you and bless you with His shalom. That is His peace that passes all understanding. His presence, His omnibenevolence. That is His goodness and His favor over you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. We are dismissed. Do hang around for a while and chat and fellowship.